Good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Beam, and I have the uh, pleasure and the privilege of serving uh, as the Secretary of the Kansas Department of Agriculture. I want to welcome you to this evening's webinar, Clearing the Confusion, Meat Marketing Consumer Basics. This webinar was designed for consumers that are interested in learning more about basic meat science, common meat processing questions, as well as recipes and, and other resources. Uh, we've learned that consumers are looking to build relationships and buy their food direct from the source, directly from producers if possible. The Department of Ag knows that agriculture keeps changing to suit customers' evolving needs and farmers and ranchers are dedicated to supporting them through innovative programming and other opportunities. So thanks again for taking time out of your schedule to join us this evening. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Suzanne uh, for further introductions. Good evening. Thank you, Secretary Beam. I'm Suzanne Ryan Numerick, and I'm with the Kansas Department of Agriculture, Division of Agriculture Marketing. We're so glad you've chosen to spend your evening with us. I'd like to review some housekeeping items before we get started. During the presentation portion of the webinar, all participant microphones will be muted. If you have a question during the presentation, please submit your question using the Q&A button or chat function at the bottom of your screen. Written questions and comments will be monitored by the Kansas Department of Agriculture. At any time during the webinar when asking a question, please include your name, city, and organization if applicable. This session will be recorded and will be posted online at a later date. I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Colette Castor is trained as a meat scientist and has degrees from South Dakota State University and the University of Nebraska. She currently serves as the executive director of the Professional Animal Auditor Certification Organization, also known as PACO, which helps to meet the needs of the animal welfare auditing training, certification, and auditing for the livestock industry. Additionally, Colette is CEO of the American Meat Science Association, an organization representing the world's leading meat scientists. She has more than 25 years of experience in food safety, quality assurance, and animal welfare. And with that, I'll turn it over to Colette. Thank you, Suzanne. I appreciate the invitation very much. And I will get to work on sharing my screen to make sure I get to the right part so you guys don't have to read my emails and help me sort those out this evening. And we'll get it set up to show. Suzanne, is it in presenter mode for you? Do I need to correct that? Yes. Yes, yes please. There. How's that? There we go. All right. Very good. Uh, well, welcome. And as Suzanne said, um, and uh, Secretary Beam, thank you for spending your evening with us. It's a big task to give you an introduction to meat science in 20 or 25 minutes. So I will be zipping along through some of my topics. What I tried to do was to give you a little bit of a flavor for the topics that Suzanne asked me to speak about within meat science, but also some key issues within the industry. And then if we want to go deeper into anything, we can cover it during the questions and answers. So as I said, we're going to cover a few topics in a very short time frame. A little bit about meat science and the trends, food safety, animal welfare. I just tried to pick out a few things that uh, I thought you would want to learn more about. Labeling, because Suzanne said there was a lot of interest in label claims. Non-meat alternatives, and then a little bit about COVID, its impact on the meat industry now and potentially in the future. So what the heck is meat science? Even within the association, which has about 2,300 members, we're a very, very diverse group and it covers a lot of different topics. And I think back to when I had to explain to my own mom what I was doing becoming a meat scientist and, uh, and trying to make it a little bit more clear to her. But basically meat science are people who do not only research but application 
throughout the meat industry, all the land grant universities, K-State, Iowa State, Mizzou, South Dakota State, Nebraska, et cetera, to look at everything that happens with the animal from the time that cells are being formed from a genetic standpoint, all the way through the finished product. So I tried to highlight a number of the bigger categories and we'll be touching on a few of these in more specifics. So muscle biology, we, you know, some of the first things that we learn about are how does the conversion of muscle to meat work? Because it's very important when you get into palatability considerations, the aging of meat, food safety, um, carcass composition drives lean, fat, marbling, which I'll talk about in another slide, and the nutritional content, which of course leads us to the role of meat in the diet, which is a very hot topic right now. Eating quality, I'll show you a little bit about marbling. There's always a, a healthy debate amongst meat scientists, um, as well as chefs and consumers about whether it's more important to have high marbling or better tenderness to age something longer. And of course, we each have our own unique preferences and, and uh, flavor characteristics. Meat science is also about functionality. So meat is very interesting in that it's about 75% water. And one of the things we like to do in the meat industry is make sure that we hang on to that water because it gives juiciness, it gives meat its texture, its bite. And so we talk about things like water holding capacity, what happens when we use ingredients like salt or sodium nitrite um, as we try to preserve and, and prepare meat in a lot of fun and delicious ways. I'll have a slide that talks about specifically about meat safety. So I won't cover this right now. Um, and then preservation is an important part. So thermal, when we're making bacon, when we're making ham, the refrigeration process, making sure that we hold things at the applicable temperatures. And then I'll cover a couple of other topics like animal welfare and sustainability. So in true meat nerd fashion, as we like to call ourselves, we actually start by giving a very specific definition of meat. And a little bit of historical background on that is that there used to be kind of a push pull between red and white meat. And so for a long time, meat scientists didn't necessarily work with other species, particularly poultry, turkey, or as is very prevalent now, aquaculture. And you'll see that from the definition of meat, it actually goes um, very specifically down to protein, tissues, the associated other things that come along with that, fat, bone, offal, um, not A-U-F-U-L, but offal, O-F-F-A-L, the byproducts that come along with the, with the production of meat. So everything that could be used for human consumption is included under the term meat. This becomes pretty important in um, one of the final slides where I'm going to talk to you about alternative meat products and, and how we label things. A few basic meat facts. I already told you this first one, that meat is about 75% water. While that makes it juicy, it also makes it highly perishable. It's a very moist product. What do bacteria like to live on? Things that are a, a, a moist and wet environment with lots of, of tasty food, like the protein that's in it. It's about 25% protein. And for those of you who've ever gone on a low carb diet, you know that you can pretty much eat a lot of meat on a low carb diet because it only has a fractional amount of carbohydrates, really just the remnants of, of minerals and vitamins that are there. We do know that younger animals are more palatable typically than older animals. And so we talk about market hogs versus sows and boars. Sows are sometimes done, uh, taken through a process called hot boning which is very unique and it helps give products like bratwurst their characteristic texture, color, and flavor. We know that steers and heifers are definitely more tender than cows and bulls. In fact, cows and bulls are not eligible to go through the quality grading process as are steers and heifers. So you could never see something labeled choice that was either a cow or a bull. So typically for those older animals, we'll see them going into um, ground products, ground beef, um, as I said, bratwurst, that kind of thing. And the reason is they have um, more connective tissue, they have a darker color, sometimes they'll have a little bit different flavor, particularly in the case of um, intact males for swine um, 
that has something called bortane. So that's a little bit of a, a description. I chose a couple of pictures just to show you and orient you a little bit further to some of the terminology. We have external fat. We've got seam fat that goes in between the muscles, also known as intermuscular fat. And then we have marbling, which I already mentioned, which is intramuscular fat. So in beef, marbling is a big factor in quality grades, prime, choice, um, and select, which is the lower of the, the quality grades. Um, in pork, much less marbling, typically in the area of one and a half to two percent, whereas beef would typically be in the five to eight percent range. Um, and so in pork, we definitely are looking typically more at tenderness than marbling. And there really isn't a quality grading system that relates to marbling in pork. Meat consumption, you can see that meat consumption has continued to rise, the three main species being beef, pork, and broilers by far. Um, and you see also that it has recently um, begun to plateau. Um, and that's probably not surprising with this kind of a, a level of increase. I wanna tell you just a little bit about food safety as well. It's a big success story for the meat industry and it's an important part of what you should be working with either as you're sharing information with other people or as a consumer yourself. So you can ask any meat scientist kids and they've all been trained um, about many of the things I'll talk about in the next slide. We really look at three key food safety areas, the biological, chemical, and physical. Biological, of course, are bacteria. And we think about you know, some of the big pathogens that I've mentioned here, E. coli, salmonella, campylobacter, listeria. We have a great story to tell in the meat industry. Here's an example with a slide showing the reduction in E. coli contamination. When I first started working in the meat industry, that was when some of the um, unfortunate incidences happened um, with ground beef. And the steps that the beef industry has taken to get that under control, all the way from the feedlot, through the plant, through how we handle the product, through cooking, even in the fast food restaurants, is a huge success story. Our bigger challenge more recently has been physical. So we do a lot of things in an automated way in plants, and that can result sometimes in um, plastic or bone ending up in product. And so physical is a very big food safety contamination as well. And then chemical, making sure that we control residues, um, anything that was given to the animal prior to slaughter, ingredients, additives, hormones. And then the other thing we that we do to affect um, food safety is through packaging, making sure that we put it in an environment where there's no oxygen um, whenever possible, you know that people have moved away uh, from fresh product being paper wrapped and more and more into the vacuum packaging and the over wrap that you're accustomed to seeing in the stores. So even though uh, we're doing a ton of things in the meat industry, it's really important to educate consumers about food safety at home. And this is a big initiative all the way from USDA through extension um, with some key things. Now, thanks to COVID, we've heard wash your hands until we're blue in the face, right? Um, so hopefully we're getting better about that. But it's also important to follow the label instructions for how to handle product to use thermometers. I've got a little picture of a guy called Thermy here that talks about um, endpoint cooking temperature. Even, it doesn't matter how professional you are, you should still use a thermometer to ensure that you've hit those key temperatures that will get rid of um, any pathogens or cross-contamination that could accidentally occur. Speaking of cross-contamination, making sure you're changing cutting boards, you're never preparing salad, or the, the favorite one that people are always a little bit taken aback by is using the same plate um, to take things off the grill as you did to put it on the grill. Uh, that's one that people used to be much more casual about. And then making sure that you are familiar with food temperature, food refrigeration and temperature controls. So you can see over here, um, the danger zone, of course, is between 40 and 140. So that's where we either want to get it into the refrigerator or we want to keep it hot above 140. And then further uh, to the right on my screen, you can see the, the endpoint temperatures for different products. I do want to call your attention to a couple of them, right? So most, uh, most everybody used to cook all meat to 160 to 170. Um, we know that some people used to like to order ground beef um, 
rare, medium rare. Um, you'll still have some restaurants ask you for that. It really, for safety purposes, um, really needs to be cooked to 155 degrees. The, the one that's quite interesting, though, is pork. And pork um, in a whole muscle product, like a chop um, or uh, anything that's not ground, can, can be cooked to 145 degrees. So people have a long track record of overcooking pork and certainly don't need to do that uh, anymore with that good news. Uh, just a little bit about animal welfare, um, switching gears, which I'll do a couple times through here, um, and I'll try to bounce this forward as quickly as possible. So farmers and veterinarians um, have a great track record, and they're really well perceived amongst consumers for animal welfare, and they really focus on, on three things. So of course, we've always focused on physically, how are the animals doing? But more and more, we're looking at trying to put together environments where they can express some natural behaviors. Um, and taking into account their mental state, making sure that they're not hungry, that we're trying to remove anything that could be painful, that we're taking care of them um, should they become ill or need treatment. Um, but it's definitely a key area. Um, it's focused on by a lot of different constituents, whether it's consumers, activists, government regulators. Um, so it's a, certainly a hot topic for people working in the meat industry. All right, switching gears again to labeling. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the label requirements and some of the label claims because I think that will be of, of interest to this group. Label requirements create a quandary. So what is put on a package is dictated by the USDA Food Safety and Inspection Service. So they're the ones that oversee everything that we do uh, within the, the facilities. They oversee claims as well. And so if a claim um, is on there, and it's not never, it may need to have a qualifying statement. Um, so if there's, a, if there's a caveat to it. Marketing people also like to get involved in label claims, um, which is always challenging. So here's a great example um, that I've always used in a lot of different presentations because I think this shows almost every claim you could potentially put on a product. The other things that I've put off here to the side are things that are required no matter even if you were gonna make the most plain Jane product possible, you would have to have these elements, the safe handling instructions, where the product was produced, the establishment number, keeping it refrigerated, if it's a fresh product, a perishable product, and its net weight, as well as the name of the product, this is chicken. Um, those all have to be there or it's a non-compliant label. So that's like the, the lowest bar. Then we get into all the different label claims as well. And I did want to make a note here that we've got, um, there is a claim here um, about raised without added hormones. And you see the little asterisk. There's always a lot of questions. It's not currently legal to use hormones in either poultry or in swine, but it's commonly perceived that that's done. So because it's not legal, um, then there has to be a little asterisk that says, hey, we're, we're making this claim, even though legally we can't do that. Another um, example of claims are raised without antibiotics, antibiotic free, which has to um, only be used if um, it's documented, natural, which is a very broadly defined claim, grass fed, um, and this label happens to have a number of different claims on it as well. So it has organic and grass fed. That doesn't mean that they're necessarily tied together. And then organic. And most people use the National Organic Program now, which is abbreviated the, the NOP. And that's also run through USDA, but it's run through the, the Ag Marketing Service. Okay, another product where labeling is going to become very important in the future are the alternative meat products. So many of you have already seen plant-based protein products. You've heard about um, the Impossible Burger, uh, Beyond Beef. Uh, here's a couple examples of pork-like products in ground and uh, meatball and patty form. That's generation one. Generation two, uh, which is just going through the whole um, regulatory framework process and being ramped up from kind of an idea and testing purpose is cell-based. And the idea there is to actually create and grow meat cells into meat shapes 
uh, using fermentation in a process. So Memphis meats is an example of that. And you'll be hearing more about each of those things. And there's quite a discussion about who regulates this, how is it labeled, all of that kind of thing. All right, a few other trends that we're seeing happen, um, accelerated, of course, by COVID are um, the, the meal kits. So um, the driving up and receiving your product, shopping online, um, and then one thing you may have noticed post COVID is some of your favorite products may have disappeared, whether you went to McDonald's and all of a sudden they didn't have biscuits and gravy, or you went to look for a, a particular type of pasta or even meat that you liked, people consolidated their SKUs or their product codes uh, to try to simplify things and just to try to get product moving through the system as everything was happening. So these were trends that were already happening that have been accelerated uh, post uh, during COVID and, and as we move hopefully toward post COVID. And thank you to Center for Food Integrity for the information on this slide. A little bit more about COVID in the meat industry because some of you have, have undoubtedly heard discussions about that. Um, definitely the meat industry was front and center at the beginning. It had a lot of things that uh, made it unique um, to uh, potentially having clusters and it's had to work through a lot of things in a really tremendous way. So um, these were some of the, it's the initial challenges. One of the things that's gonna be a fallout from this is that in the meat industry, labor was already a challenge and now it will be even more challenging. And so it's driving automation. And here you can see some examples of automation and robotics that are used. Um, and rather than thinking about it as removing jobs from the meat industry, what I see it doing is shifting jobs to more highly skilled trades. So um, you're definitely trading people who were running knives on very basic entry level jobs for technicians that can run very sophisticated equipment. Um, so that is kind of a, a good news, bad news story, if you will. Um, I'll stop there. I think I managed to keep that uh, within one minute of my allocated time. Um, I will tell you um, that if you have questions now, we can answer them. I did put together a slide of some resources, um, which I can share uh, with uh, the uh, Kansas Department of Ag team and you can gain additional information on many of the things that I talked about uh, from those resources as well, because I had very little time to cover a lot of topics. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Colette. I'm not seeing any questions in the Q&A quite yet. Uh, just a reminder that that button is available. If you had any questions, uh, we might go ahead and let Chad get started. And if we have questions come in, then we may um, answer those at the end of the session. Great, thank you. Thank you, Colette. Well, I have the pleasure of introducing Chad. I'm Dana with the Kansas Department of Agriculture. And Chad is a friend of agriculture and a true entrepreneur. Chad and his investors have gotten a foothold in the state's small retail meat market. They own Bowser Meats of Meriden, Heartland Meats in Holton, and Lawrence. Uh, they also own Yoder Meats in Yoder and Cecil K's hometown grocery in Holton. Chad helps with the family cattle company and his interest in the cattle industry started at a young age. He recognizes that there is more value as that gets added as the supply chain goes along. This in turn led to his interest in the meat processing side of the industry. Chad and his wife Mandy and their four daughters live in Holton and Mandy and Chad also own the Pines in Holton which is a senior care facility. Chad's going to provide us information from the processor perspective this evening. Chad, the microphone's yours. All right, thank you, Dana. I appreciate that. And thanks to all the folks that have joined us this evening. Uh, glad to have you. My job tonight's to talk about uh, what goes on a little bit in the processing plant, particularly uh, small local processors and um, how you may be able to access that meat if that's something you're looking for or if you just uh, want to understand a little bit better uh, how that might compare um, to meat that's available in the grocery store and, and what the similarities and differences are there. So uh, let me talk about just processing uh, for a little bit and say that that meat processing, regardless of where it's done, it could be a big 
national corporation plant, or it could be the the local meat locker down the street. Um, many of the processes are the same, and certainly um, the live animals going in and the meat products coming out are going to be uh, very similar. But there's some things along the way that will make that uh, unique to the specific facility and um, some opportunities for customers to customize uh, specifically what they want if they're taking an animal in or, or buying their meat directly from those uh, processing plants. So if you're, um, if you're a consumer, you're not raising your own livestock, uh, but you say, I would really like to uh, purchase some locally raised meat. There's a couple of options there and things to think about. First is, um, do you know someone who is a farmer or rancher and has an animal uh, available that, that you wanna buy and, and have that specifically as yours? Or do you just want to do um, weekly grocery shopping, so to speak, and get uh, a little smaller quantities of meat um, with each purchase, but be able to buy uh, local products. So let's start with, uh, you know, somebody with an animal. Uh, so you're going to make those arrangements with them uh, ahead of time. The animal comes into our processing plant, and then you're going to have the opportunity as the customer to tell us how do you uh, want us to cut and package that meat. So the information that we will have for you is uh, the total weight of the animal once it's been harvested. So basically uh, carcass weight on the rail. And um, from there, there's all kinds of options. So do you want roast? Do you want steaks? Do you want ground product? Um, and how much of each, how do you want it packaged? Do you like your steaks three quarters of an inch? or do you like them an inch and a half? Uh, do you like two of them in a package together? Do you want them individually packaged? So there's um, a whole range of options there. Do you like five pound roast because you have a little bigger family or is it a smaller household? And so a three pound roast is better. And so um, it doesn't matter if you're working with one of my plants or if, if you're uh, dealing with your local uh, plant in your community, someone there is going to be able to walk you through all those questions. You don't have to necessarily uh, know all the answers before you start that conversation. They're going to give you the options uh, and talk through that with you and you can kind of decide what you want to do. In terms of cost uh, on those products, you know that you're going to have, have to have uh, purchased the animal from the local farmer. And those arrangements, you know, you will have worked out with them, whether it's a live weight purchase. So, you know, the finished steer weighs 1,400 pounds and you're paying $1.10 per pound, or are you going to pay on the hanging weight on the rail? So we, we um, harvest the animal and it weighs, you know, the carcass weighs 900 pounds on the rail. You know, are you going to buy it that way? And it's going to be uh, $2 a pound or something like that, or, um, you know, is the farmer that you're buying it from, are they going to uh, deliver it to the plant? They're going to pay for the processing and they're going to give you an all-inclusive price uh, at the end of the process. I mean, there's lots of options there and it, it doesn't really matter from the processor's perspective how you decide to go about that. Um, I guess selfishly, I'll say that somebody has to pay the processor. So if the farmer isn't going to offer you an all-inclusive pricing that includes that processing fee, then that may be your responsibility. And so every plant will have a fee schedule. Um, there'll be some charges based on the weight of the animal. Typically, there'll be charges based on specific products. So let's say you're um, having a hog process and you want bacon and you want smoked pork chops and uh, some of those types of uh, items that require further processing. So in both of those cases, smoked pork chops and, 
and bacon that's a cured and smoked product. So that's going to be more steps in the processing. And there's likely going to be a little bit of an upcharge um, on those or an additional fee that goes towards that. And again, the processing plant will have a fee schedule. They can walk through all of that with you so you understand exactly what's going on if you are um, paying directly to the plant. The other option would be, uh, and we do a lot of this as well, you say, I want to buy a side of beef as an example, or half a hog or whatever it may be, uh, but I don't have the animal. Well, we have slots in our uh, plant schedule every month uh, for what we call uh, plant beef, which those are animals that are going to come in and we intend to sell them to folks that call up and say they want a side of beef or a quarter or whatever. So we're supplying the animal, you give the cutting instructions and, and we go on our merry way. The third option there is going to be um, more of a retail option. So you come in, you know, you get five pounds of hamburger to get you through the week. You get a roast, you get a few steaks, you get some pork chops, whatever it is um, that's on the menu for your at-home cooking. You can stop in your local meat locker and make those purchases. Most lockers like ours have some sort of retail front. We happen to have um, some retail stores that our plants are supplying. And then we also sell uh, directly to con customers right out of the plant as well. So you can walk in uh, to the Bowser plant in Meriden, for example, and you can buy a one pound package of bacon uh, right out of the front of the plant there if that's something that you want to do and so it, it's really up to the customer how they want to um, go about making those purchases certainly there's some financial incentive to buy in bulk so to speak so you know if you buy a side of beef you know you can you can pay for the animal you can pay for the processing you can have that at home in your uh, deep freezer for a much lower cost per pound average than if you bought all of those pieces uh, individually through the grocery store or or even out of the retail case at the meat locker. So um, it just depends on what you want to do. Lots of options there. And again, your local processor uh, can walk you through all of that. Colette talked a little bit about food safety and labeling and that kind of thing. Um, for the local processing plant, you could potentially see a couple different things on the label. So the plants that I own are all um, fully inspected plants. The state of Kansas, Kansas Department of Agriculture inspectors are on site um, every day that we're harvesting animals. They watch that process. They have to see the animal alive and then they watch it uh, and inspect that process all the way through until there's a carcass hanging in the cooler. And then on the processing side, they're also uh, monitoring that. So we typically will have a state inspector um, in our facilities every day of the week. And so that product that comes out is gonna have uh, an inspected and passed um, marking on the label. It's gonna say our our establishment number. So for example, Yoder Meats establishment number is 82. And you'll see that in our um, inspection stamp on all of our labels on that product that comes through the plant. But if it's a if it's a purely custom product, there is an opportunity um, for that to go through the process without inspection. And that's really up to the plant and the customer as far as what they have going on there. So uh, you bring in your own animal we process it and it and 100 percent of that meat is going back to you it does not have to be inspected we um, we do it in our facilities but not every facility does and not every facility is required to uh, but it, so but it has to be um, truly a custom product where the owner of the animal is taking all of the meat if we're selling that you know, into a wholesale situation or if we're selling it through our retail stores, then it needs to be uh, fully inspected and, and we're doing that. But I don't
don't want you to be alarmed if you go to the local processing plant and you get a uh, half a hog and and the packages you get them home and there's no mark of inspection on it. It could say custom, not for sale, and that just means that it's it's strictly for your use and it's not meant for for you to turn around and sell that to someone else. Um, so that's an option there. We like to have all of our uh, product inspected because um, we're running animals through there that are going into our re retail stores that are going to our wholesale accounts. And, um, you know, half of an animal may be going to an individual customer that's going to take it home and put it in the deep freezer and the other half may be uh, getting processed for a wholesale account. So uh, we just inspect everything and then there's no question about what is going on there. Another common thing that comes up is, um, you know, I raise my own uh, goats, for example, and I want to sell the meat at the local farmer's market. What do we have to do to make that happen? Well, um, it actually works very similar to if you were just going to take the meat home yourself. So you schedule an appointment, you bring the animals into the processing plant, we process them to your specifications. Uh, you may have specific um, type of packaging or a label that you want to put on your packages or whatever the case may be. You may say, I want all of the, the goat chops, you know, four per package. That's just my standard. That's how I like to present it and, and give it to the customer. And that, that can all be arranged. That's no problem. You still have the, all the processing fees and so forth. It needs to be inspected product so then you can take it go to the farmer's market and sell it there so that's certainly um, easy enough to do one of the things that you will run into at all of the meat processing plants in kansas and i assume um, in surrounding states as well is that they are fully booked um, for whatever reason COVID has really increased people's interest in um, local meat, uh, local processing, raising their own animals or buying from a neighbor or friend or whatever the case may be. And so uh, at my plants, we're fully booked through 2021. And I know that's the case uh, with many other plants as well. Um, like I said, we do have spots where we've allocated uh, space to our own animals so that then we can sell to customers that come along. So that's definitely an option, but in terms of your own animal and wanting to find um, a plant that can help you out with that, it may be tricky. Uh, I would go ahead and look and start making arrangements and figure out how you can get on the schedule because, um, you know, the year will go by and then there will be uh, more opportunities. So that's something to be thinking about if you're making plans for the future, you know, make sure you have a have a conversation with the processing plant to ensure that you've got um, a spot on the schedule for an animal. I think with that, uh, I'll call it quits and, and would be happy to answer any questions now or um, later on at the end of the presentation. Thanks, Jack. Chad, appreciate that. And we'll do some questions at the end. We've had some come in on the Q&A function. So with that, I'll turn it over to Suzanne for our next introduction. Thanks, Dana. I'll go ahead and introduce Abby. She is a registered dietitian and director of nutrition for the Kansas Beef Council. Abby is passionate about sharing science-based nutrition information with consumers. She's responsible for leading the Kansas Beef Council nutrition programming that focuses on beef nutrition, outreach to influencers in the health profession, Kansas schools, and local blogger and social media influencers. And with that, Abby, I'll let you go ahead and get started with your presentation. All right, well, thank you, Suzanne, for introducing me. Um, I'm really happy to join Colette and Chad tonight and welcome you into my kitchen to provide you with some resources and some recipes that will help you prepare some of those unique cuts of beef that you might get if you're buying directly from a producer. 
these um, resources that, that I'm going to share with you, I'm just going to do some screen sharing. They are provided on a PDF that's going to be emailed to you after this session. So don't worry about screenshotting any of these particular websites. Um, they will be sent to you via after the session. So if I can get my screen share to work real quick. All right. So the first thing I want to share with you is the Kansas Beef Council's website, which is kansasbeef.org. Now on that website, we actually have a beef directory and that's for Kansas beef producers to list themselves on here if they are selling directly to the consumer. This is alphabetized by county all the way from Anderson down to Washington County. And if a producer is selling directly to the consumer, then they're able to put their contact information on here, how they're um, selling their beef. So whether you can buy it by appointment online, or if they have a storefront. And it also lists how that beef can be purchased, whether it's by the cut, um, by the quarter, the side, the whole, or even in bundles like Chad was talking about. If you yourself are a producer, you can add yourself to this directory if you're not already on here by clicking on the here that I'm circling right now. And that's a great place, again, for consumers to find producers in the state of Kansas. This webpage is also kind of a one-stop shop for all the other information that Chad was talking about in addition to more of that information that a consumer might need if you're purchasing beef from a producer for the first time. It can seem like a daunting or an intimidating task. So we really wanna make this a really easy process for you by finding, uh, providing all the information in one spot. If you click on the ultimate Q&A of beef, uh, director um, order beef, of direct order beef, then that's a really um, great page as well that'll link you over to cut sheet examples and a lot of that stuff that Chad was talking about. If you click on the how much beef little tab, you're gonna get a two page PDF that pulls up. And I really like sharing this PDF with consumers. So if you're a consumer yourself purchasing beef for the first time and you need to talk to the processor through the cut sheet, this is a really great PDF because it lists a lot of the cuts that you're gonna get from the different primals on the animal. Um, and it makes it a lot easier when you're not used to um, knowing which cuts come from which parts of the, the carcass. All right, so I'm gonna stop screen sharing real quick. And again, welcome back into my kitchen. So I wanna talk a little bit about some of these unique cuts that you might get from a producer when you are purchasing directly from them. Now you have two options with some of those unique cuts. The first option would be to get the cuts that you know that you love and you're comfortable cooking with when you're talking through that cut sheet with the processor. And then you can ask the processor to have some of those cuts that you're not comfortable with or don't want to be cut into stew meat or to be ground and added into your hamburger mixture. An example of this would be if you are going to, if you're not a big fan of cube steaks or minute steaks, they're the same thing where that round beef um, steak has been tenderized really well and it creates a really great country fried steak. But if your family's not into those or you don't wanna cook those, then you can have that round steak ground up and it can be added to your hamburger mixture. Um, Chad can also answer more questions on that. But that's actually what I did the first time I ever bought from a producer. Um, I, my family doesn't eat a lot of round steaks, especially the bottom round um, area that tends to be a, a little less tender. And so I had a lot of my round ground into hamburger meat and that round portion of the animal is actually really lean. So it's designated lean by USDA standards and it made my overall hamburger mixture even leaner. Um, because my family eats a lot of hamburger and a lot of ground beef, this worked really well for my family. And I do tend to order in the springtime. So in the springtime, I tend to have a lot of my round portion ground up and added to the hamburger mixture. And then as I've gotten more comfortable with some of those roasts and steaks in the fall, I tend to have those actually kept more, especially the top round portion, kept as top round steaks or top round roasts because they're really great when we're having those um, comfort uh, food recipes in the cold winter months. So that would be one option is to talk with your processor about what you can do with some of those cuts that you're not really comfortable with. The other thing that you can do is to get adventurous in your kitchen and to try out new recipes that are unique and have a little bit of different you know, swing to them than what you're used to. So I'm gonna show you some of these unique cuts 
um, that I started getting when I purchased directly from producers. And one of those would be soup bones. It's not something that I would typically um, get, grab at the grocery store, but I will tell you this has a lot of meat on it. Obviously you can see, and it makes a delicious beef stock. So this would be one of those. Another one would be the neck bone. Again, not something you might purchase directly at the grocery store, but that neck bone also is great for beef stock and it has a lot of meat on it. And then something that can be a little intimidating to a general consumer is the oxtail. Don't be deterred by the knobby appearance. It really does probably make one of the richest beef stock out there. And that's why a lot of um, professional chefs love oxtail. Because if you take any of these cuts and you slow roast them in a slow cooker or a pressure cooker, you're gonna break down that cartilage and marrow and you're gonna get a delicious, delicious gelatin that provides you with a stock that's really rich and hearty for beef stews or for beef and vegetable soups. So that's definitely something that you want to do with those bones that are a little bit maybe intimidating to look at, but they really do make a delicious um, beef stock. Now, the other thing that you might find is some of your cuts come from muscles of the animal that work a lot harder. And because those muscles work a lot harder, they tend to have um, more connective tissue in them. And they need to, that connective tissue needs to be broken down in order for that meat to become a little bit more tender to eat. That's going to come from that hip area, like I was talking about before with the round roast. Um, so again, you could have that tenderized into cube steaks or minute steaks, or definitely you want to cook it low and slow if you're doing those roasts. Um, other areas would be like the arm roast or the chuck roast as well, coming from the shoulder section. That also needs to be cooked low and slow. So anything with a lot of connective tissue, just think low and slow. That is the way to cook those in an Instapot or um, a pressure cooker or in a slow cooking method. Other things that come with a lot of connective tissue are steaks. So you might see on this flat iron steak here, if my camera will show it, you see a lot of striations of that connective tissue running through it. And that um, does also show that you should probably cook it low and slow if you want to. Brisket, for example, is usually cooked low and slow by um, smoking it. You've got, in addition to this flat iron here, you've got your skirt steak, your flank steak, as I said, brisket, your um, sirloin tip steak also cooks really well when you do that low and slow method. But you don't always have to do low and slow when it comes to the steak portions for that. You can break down that connective tissue and still grill it by using what's called a tenderizing marinade. And you need three things for a tenderizing marinade. First, you need a fat. So a high temperature oil like canola oil or vegetable oil would work really well. You need an acid, so vinegar and juice is commonly used. And you also need seasoning. So that can be a combination of salt, sweetness like from honey, or it can be herbs and spices or aromatics like from onions and garlic. So again, those three things make a great tenderizing marinade, fat, acid, and seasoning. And a tenderizing marinade is the same thing as any other marinade, except you want to leave the meat in that marinade for six to 24 hours in the refrigerator, giving it enough time to break down that connective tissue and give you a more tender cut of meat. The other thing you need to know about those marinades is you need about one fourth to one half cup of marinade per about one pound of meat. And then I like to flip it over in the refrigerator maybe once or twice to make sure all sides are getting coated evenly with that marinade. And the other thing you need to know about marinating is you want to make sure to pat all of that marinade um, off of your meat and dry it off with paper towel and then throw the paper towel away before you put it on the grill. Because what's happening is you're putting your protein, your meat onto the heat of that grill. And that's what creates this amazing chemical reaction called a Maillard reaction. Now, I'm probably butchering that word because it's French. But anyway, the Maillard reaction is what happens when you connect that protein and heat together. And the thing about that is it produces that brown caramelly coloring that you get on your meat. And it gives you that beautiful beefy flavor that you really love. So you wanna make sure that Maillard reaction is happening. And the only thing that inhibits that Maillard reaction is moisture or fluid. So you wanna get as much of that uh, marinade off of your meat before you put it on the grill. That's a really good tip. Another cut that you might get because you don't see it at the grocery store is beef heart. Now that can be really intimidating, um, but it is actually a very hardworking muscle as opposed to an organ meat like your liver. 
It is um, going to be very versatile as a cut of beef. It can be seared, sauteed, um, grilled, or even braised. But the thing about that is you do have a lot of connective tissue and um, on that cut. So you have to make sure that when you're cutting all those chambers apart into small pieces of heart, you wanna make sure you're trying to remove any connective tissue that you see on the outsides of the chambers and any extra fat. Um, because there's no marbling in your heart like you would get in a really good ribeye steak, you wanna cook it to more of a rare or medium rare temperature like you would a tenderloin roast. So that'll help prevent any toughness from happening. Another different unique cut would be the beef tongue. This is something that you typically find in Mexican cuisine. Um, so if you think of taco, tacos de lengua would be some way that I know I've tried them and they're delicious. So you wanna take that beef tongue and put it in your slow cooker, cover it with a little bit of water, and then you're gonna simply um, slow cook it low and slow until it's done, slice it really thin, and then sear it until it's crispy on all sides, okay? And that makes a great snack, appetizer, again, taco filling that goes really well with a cold beer. And then last but not least, of course, you have the beef liver. So if you're not comfortable with beef liver, know that you can cook it low and slow in a pressure cooker or um, slow cooker with your onions, just like grandma used to do, and it turns out really well, or you can bread it and pan fry it. Now, if you're not a fan of beef liver and you just don't wanna mess with it, you can also cook it up, cut it thin, and it makes a really great dog treat. That's very nutritious. So something else that the whole family might enjoy. I know my two dogs do. All right, so those are some really quick ideas to use some of those unique cuts that you might not be comfortable with. And then I wanna share um, two more resources with you real quick that I'm gonna screen share. So you're gonna see here beefitswhatsfordinner.com. This is another great website that allows you to find lots of recipes, cooking techniques, um, nutrition information, which of course is my fun forte, and then even production methods, how beef is raised here in the United States. But what I wanna click on is this cuts tab, if you will. So if you go to the cuts tab, this is really fun for consumers who are not used to some of these rare and unique cuts. Sorry, if I could top, I can't uh, obviously type and talk at the same time. But you can type in a cut like a sirloin tip roast. And like I said, that comes from the round section. And it usually needs a little bit more TLC to make it nice and tender. But you can click on that particular cut and scroll down and find more information on the cut. But I also like that it shows you what cooking methods work really well for that cut. So, you know, other cuts I didn't have time to go through today because we we're limited on time would be like short ribs or um, gosh, there's so many other ones that you might not be familiar with. But if you type in the cut, it'll show you what cooking methods work really well for it. And then it'll show you the nutritionals. And then my favorite part is it will show you recipes that work really well with that particular cut of beef. So very good lifesaver for those home chefs that are not familiar with all those cuts. And then I also wanna share with you um, the Kansas Beef Council's recipe for the heart, from the Heartland series. These are recipes that we have um, collaborated with local chefs to create. And these chefs are from Kansas and the Midwest and they have produced these delicious recipes that are restaurant quality that you can cook in the comfort of your own kitchen. So each chef has provided all the ingredients, the how to prepare um, information, and then the Kansas Beef Council has also put together a recipe video with these chefs individually on how to prepare, again, this restaurant quality meal in the comfort of your own kitchen. So it's a really great resource to make you feel like you know what you're doing in the kitchen. And then lastly, if you scroll back up to the top, I just wanted to highlight and let you all know that um, the Kansas Beef Council has lots of recipe inspiration, um, lots of videos, cooking videos, really short ones, longer ones that the chef will talk you through like these ones, but they're on Facebook, they're on Pinterest, they're on YouTube and they're on Instagram. So definitely follow the Kansas Beef Council on those social media platforms if you're looking for more recipes on how to cook beef in your own kitchen. And with that, I'll sign off because I know we probably have some questions and we have very little time. Thank you all so much. Great, thanks Abby. That was a super presentation and really enjoyed uh, the websites and the information that you presented to us. We do have a great set of questions that have come in. 
Uh, and I want to start with uh, Colette. Um, we had a question that came in on what are the differences between state and USDA inspection? Is that something you can help us with a definition on? Yeah, no, that is a, a good question and it's confusing. Um, and I know parts of the answers, but uh, Chad may know more about this too because some things have changed um, not too long ago. So the federal government offers um, inspection to what's called amenable species. So these are the typical um, species that we'd be talking about, beef, pork, um, at no cost. We pay them for overtime in the industry, but uh, the rest of the cost is at the, the cost of the taxpayer to make sure that the meat products are produced safely. Many states have traditionally offered state inspection as well. And that was done to help smaller processors not have to bear the cost of becoming federally inspected. Well, over the years, the requirements have become such that the requirements for state inspection are supposed to be compatible with federal inspection. Um, before state inspected facilities weren't allowed to market across state lines, but there's been some changes there too. And I'd like Chad, if he, I have a feeling he'll know more about that, um, the most recent changes with that than I. And then he also mentioned kind of the third category, which is um, custom slaughtered, which doesn't have to undergo inspection, but of course is still done in a very um, safe and, and appropriate manner um, for you to use for your own personal use. Do you have anything to add, Chad, to that? I, Colette did a really nice job there. The only thing I would say is you can, um, there is an option to be a state inspected facility and still ship product across state lines, but you have to be, um, there's some language in the regulations that typically a state inspection program is, has to be equal to the federal inspection program. They don't have to do everything exactly the same, but you have to be able to end up with the same result in terms of food safety and compliance with all the regulation. Well, there's another category that's called same as. So if the state inspection program is the same as the federal inspection program, you can actually uh, then sell that product across state lines just like you could if you were USDA inspected. I've in, investigated a lot of those different options and, and my personal opinion from the processing standpoint is if you wanna sell product across state lines, you, it would be just as easy to become a federally inspected plant and not have to worry about all of the extra steps uh, to do it as a state inspected plant. I'm glad you said that because that's always what I had kind of wondered to myself. Um, so I'm glad to hear you say that. It always seemed like if you were going to do that, you might as well go the whole way. Chad, we had a question specifically about crossing state lines with, with selling um, product. Would it be best to say that producers that want to sell direct across state lines work with their depart state department of agriculture to find out what those rules and regulations are? Uh, would that be the first place to start? I think that's a great idea, um, and it may depend, you know, in your state if if what you're doing is regulated by um, the FDA through a food safety program like it is in Kansas, or uh, if it's regulated by USDA through a meat and poultry inspection program. Um, and it could be different from state to state as far as how that works, and it will also vary depending on what you're wanting to do. You know, if you if you live in Nebraska and you bring your animal into Kansas to have it processed and then you're going to take the meat back to Nebraska and put in your deep freezer at home, there's no problem with that. But if you want to take the meat back to Nebraska and then sell it to uh, random retail consumers that you have no family connection with, that's going to be a different ballgame. So you need to understand the specific rules around that um, from your state. Great. Abby, I think you can help us with this next question. What's the best way for a consumer to know they're buying from a reputable seller? You make sure I'm unmuting myself. Um, Chad might be able to actually answer that a little bit better, but typically um, USDA inspection is really a great way to go if you're a consumer. Um, most of these producers that are listed on the beef directory, they're gonna be processed in a processing plant. All of those are USDA inspected. So. 
Got it. As a follow-up question, and Chad, you can probably go with an answer with this one. As a consumer that I've put in my uh, order to somebody selling it, you've processed it at your facility, how do I know I'm getting the meat that I purchased from my person? How is that tracked to make sure that the, once I make that purchase, what you will out in a cardboard box with packaging for my trunk is what I ordered? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, we get that a lot. Uh, we do have um, a very detailed internal process as far as how we track that. So uh, every carcass on the rail is tagged with a specific identification number. And then um, in our system, we keep track of whose name goes with that number, basically. So it's, it's not rocket science as far as how we're doing it, but uh, definitely every carcass is assigned to a person and we don't want to mess that up the other thing we uh we do we've got a window uh, that looks right into the processing room at at our plants and if customers are worried or they want to see what's going on or they want to personally uh, inspect the process we invite them to come and watch what we're doing you know this is your animal here's all the parts and pieces you're getting just as much of it back as we can possibly give you. Because something that also comes up is, you know, the beef carcass weighed 900 pounds on the rail and I only took home, you know, 550 pounds. What happened to the rest of it? Well, depending on what you um, had us make out of it, uh, a lot of it may have been trimmed out, you know, as fat and bone that didn't wind up in packaging for you. So we, uh, part of it's knowing your processor and being able to trust them. Um, but like I said, we invite you to come and watch that if it's if it's important to you. Great. Um, Kansas, as with many states, we have a very robust 4-H FFA programs. We're going to have uh, fairs this summer. Is there going to be any lag time or uh, processing for not available for our youth that will be selling their lambs, goats, swine, and beef? What do you guys see? see coming down once we hit those summer months with those ag programs, we know how important those are to Kansas youth and, and across the country. So in our processing plants, that um, that county fair business is an important part of what we do, uh, not only to support the 4-H and FFA members, but uh, typically uh, summer is a slower time for processing. So we look forward to the little burst of business that we get right there. And what we did in 2020 and will continue to do is we save processing time uh, for those animals, you know, for the county fairs that we typically service. So uh, where you might, you know, if your local plant's busy, it may be difficult to get in at a, a plant that doesn't normally service your fair. But you know, for the county fairs that we typically service and at Yoder Meats, we service the state fair as well. Um, we've saved spots for that and are prepared to do that business. Well, great. I have a couple specific questions for you, Chad, that have, that have come in um, with us. So I'll got your attention now. So um, can a producer sell half a beef to an out-of-state individual and have them come and pick it up within our state borders. Yeah, that's no problem. Great. Um, another one is um, a question as far as what is the difference between dry aged meat done at local lockers and wet age meat found at the grocery store? Uh, that's a great question. So. Typically in the local locker plant, um, and this is this strictly for beef, what we're talking about here, the dry age versus wet age. So in the local locker plant, um, let me give you the normal schedule. So at Yoder Meats, uh, we harvest beef on Mondays. So uh, Monday, the live animal comes in, and by the end of the day, it's um, a carcass on the rail in the cooler. It is going to stay in the cooler and dry age for two weeks before we ever start breaking that down into the individual cuts that are going to go out with the customer. And so what's happening there is basically that whole carcass hangs 
you know, at 34 degrees, let's say, um, for that two week time period, you got moisture evaporating and basically you are uh, intensifying beef flavor. So from a consumer standpoint, uh, what happens during that process is you get an increase in the beefy flavor and that dry aging also helps with uh, tenderness. There's a tremendous amount of science that goes along with that that, that Colette could probably talk to uh, much more quickly and easily than I could, but um, that's what you've got going on there. For the wet age product that you typically get in the grocery store, that's that's coming into that grocery store in uh, boxed beef form for the most part. So that's going to be a whole primal. Let's say uh, KC strip loin. The whole loin comes in vacuum packaged in a box to that grocery store. Well, there's a good chance that that loin was on a live animal less than a week before then. So in the major processing plants, they are quick chilling that meat and then they start to break it down, you know, relatively quickly and then it gets shipped out to wherever it's going because it's fresh. So the wet aging happens in that vacuum package in the cooler basically. So it still has all of its moisture and its its juices that it started out with. It didn't hang in the cooler and have that evaporate. And so what you get during wet aging, um, wet aging is really good for improving the tenderness of the meat. And so my personal favorite is to have a uh, dry age product that then gets vacuum packaged and I leave in my refrigerator for two weeks before I ever uh, cook it. And then I get the best of both worlds. But that's kind of the difference between the two. Great. Thanks for that. Um, Abby, I have a question for you. And then, Chad, I'm going to have one for you to finish up the evening from some friends of ours in Idaho. So, um, Abby, you mentioned a couple different times with this, the specialty cuts that you showed about beef stock. You know, is there more information at the kansasbeef.org site on making your own beef stock and a few things like that? Because not all of us are familiar with making our, our own. Definitely. So you can go to um, beefitswhatsfordinner.com and under the recipe tab, just type in stock and you're going to come up with a great easy recipe that gives you the instructions on how to make beef stock. Really quickly though, what I would do is, especially with that soup bone that had a lot of meat still on it, I sear it in my cast iron on both sides, again, to get that caramel browning because it has so much meat still on it. And then I just put it in my slow cooker, cover it with water, and then add a maripois to it, which is usually onions, celery, and carrots, add some salt and a bay leaf, and then just cook it low and slow until the meat just falls right off the bone and it's nice and tender. Um, that's the easiest thing to do um, for my, usually my oxtail, I don't usually sear it beforehand because it doesn't have a lot of meat on it. But again, that bone and cartilage and marrow are gonna break down still and make a really delicious gelatin. That is what gives you that rich, hearty beef stew um, stock. Um, the other thing I would, I was trying to think of what else I would mention with that. Um, I, had a, I had another thought and I lost it. <laughs> But it's, it's pretty easy to do. Um, I've also done it in my Instapot. I'll throw those in. If your Instapot has the saute option, you can sear it again on both sides, add all of those ingredients. And I usually put it on for about 55 to 65 minutes. And that's a really good Instapot um, time to get all that meat off the bone. Um, go ahead and strain it off. Oh, what I was gonna mention is if you want to, you can take that stock that you just prepared, put it in the refrigerator and cool it. And then any fat that's in that is going to actually rise to the top and become more of an opaque, whiter uh, layer. And then if you want to, you can scrape that off if you want a leaner stock to go with. Um, don't be afraid of that gelatin consistency, though, that you're getting at the bottom, because that is what gives you that really rich, um, healthy, nutritious gelatin um, flavoring that you're going to want in your beef stock. Wow, that sounds great. Uh... Maybe have to go home and have a second supper. Hopefully everybody ate dinner because I'm not getting hungry myself again. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, good. Um, Chad, we have um, one more, um, some friends of ours in Idaho, that there's going to be some small hobby farmers, and they plan to sell cuts of meat at their local farmers markets and out of their home. Uh, we, they have a processing plant set up and making sure that it would be inspected, packaged, labeled. 
from a processing point of view, is there an extra cost associated with that for you guys on your end to help our friends that will be doing uh, sales to direct to consumers? That really is going to depend on whether or not they want anything extra. So if it's going to resemble what we would do for the normal custom processing, you know, someone brings in an animal and they take it all back home, probably not much in the way of upcharge. But if you have a specific packaging that it needs to go on, go in, if we have to put uh, your own label on the packaging, if you need uh, individual weights on the packages or pricing information put on the packages, anything like that that's going to add basically labor um, expense on our side, then there, there definitely could be an uptick in pricing. And that's just something to negotiate with your with your processor. Well, great. Well, thank you for that. Um, and thanks to all of our panelists tonight. Great information. We ran a little over, but we had such good questions that we wanted to keep going. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Suzanne for some wrap up comments. Yeah, I'm going to echo what Dana said. Thanks for everyone uh, that presented and shared information this evening. Thanks for everyone that spent their time learning with us this evening. And if you are interested in learning more in the direct to consumer business model, we have sessions again tomorrow and Friday at noon. We're going to cover a deeper dive into social media as well as regulatory considerations. Uh, we're gonna have a panel of direct to consumer businesses that have been successful that hopefully everyone can learn from. We'd love to have you join us um, if you have time. But again, thank you for joining us this evening. We will send out resources for you um, that Abby and Colette shared, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you guys have if the resources don't, don't answer all your questions. Thanks for joining us.